Okay, so good afternoon, good morning, or good night to all our viewers today. Welcome to the University of Oxford Alumni Event Meeting Minds 2021. Uh, I know there are guests from all over the globe, and so we welcome you all, and we hope you have a lovely afternoon with us. My name is Val Crowder, and I am the Alumni Relations Officer for the Department of Physics. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Peter Juhas. It's He's a DPhil student in the sub-department of Atomic and Laser Physics, and he's doing research on experimental quantum physics uh, on a Royal Society scholarship. He's also the president of the Cambridge and Oxford Alumni Club of Hungary, being an alumnus of the, you know, the other place. So on that note, Peter, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for this kind introduction and, and welcome everyone. Uh, I uh, hope to be able to share my screen with you, uh, but I think uh, Valerie need to make me a host for to do that. Um, and then I can share my slides. Thank you, pardon. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to share my slides now and let me know if you do see that. Yes, it's fine. Uh, it's not okay. in the full view, but it's fine. Hopefully it is now. Okay, very good. Great, so thank you very much again uh, for, for coming to this talk and, and welcome uh, to all of you. I guess some of you are alumni of the Department of Physics and some of you aren't. Uh, I uh, am Peter Juhas. I'm a, a PhD student, a DPhil student here uh, at the university. I'm a member of Pembroke College and I work on uh, experimental quantum physics. And so then my, uh, my topic will be on ultra cold atoms or an else quantum physics with the coolest stuff in the universe, which is a bold claim that I'm going to mention and, and explain it in a minute. Um, the talk is, is aimed at non-physicists necessarily. But if you do have specific questions, please let me know. I prepared a set of extra slides. So if people are interested in sort of, you know, more technical details, we can go in there. Uh, so so uh, just, uh, just, just, just let me know. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, first what quantum physics is, what it is about, you know, what, what does it mean? Um, what, what does it mean quantum physics? Uh, it's certainly a buzzword that most people have heard of and uh, quantum computing is all around in the air, but not many people necessarily know what it is. And then uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on what is it good for? Uh, and then how do we do this? And finally, to be a bit more specific, what do we actually do about it here in Oxford in my, in my, in my research group? So quantum physics is the uh, physics of the minuscule, really. So it is about, you know, uh, the smallest length scales, for example, particles, uh, the lowest temperatures, for example, superconductivity, and the smallest energies, for example, atomic interactions. And, uh, and quantum physics exhibits various unexpected and counterintuitive and beautiful phenomena, really, uh, that is just quite baffling. Now, all of this started in the early 1900s, uh, and it was dominated mostly by German and Hungarian physicists. Uh, you know, many consider Max Planck uh, to be the father of, uh, of quantum physics, really. Uh, and uh, I'm going to mention a couple of people along the way, but this is just some of the giants of quantum physics. And John von Neumann is special in this talk, uh, and uh, not only for the reason uh, uh, that he, uh, he was really the one who founded the mathematical foundations behind quantum physics, but because he's also the only person in this talk who didn't get a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, he did die very early in his 50s and therefore just didn't make there in time. Okay, uh, so continuing on from there, I'm going to introduce three sort of basic tenets of quantum physics. What is, you know, what are the sort of key principles and the key ideas behind it to be able to understand in some of the interesting phenomena? And, uh, and, and, and the first of all really is uh, the uh, particles, uh, the, the wave particle duality. So in the 1924, uh, a guy called Louis de Broglie, who was a famous French physicist, uh, came up with the idea that, well, you know, particles behave a little bit like waves and they, they have wave-like properties as well. Uh, which seemed very crazy at the time, uh, but basically what he, uh, what he said is that you could think of particles as being like waves, really. And the way he imagined it is this. He thought that uh, you can just think about having a, uh, having a wave packet traveling in time, like on this slide here, 
and then you can think of like being this like a small disturbance on on the on, on space time and it does look like you know a wave traveling but if you go far enough what you see this is just a tiny perturbance in the in the in the in the universe and you can associate that perturbance that wave as 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 being something like which is a particle so he said that okay if the if your particle has some momentum p you can associate the wavelength equals h over p where h is something called Planck's constant which is a very small number so that's that way you can associate the wavelength with anything which has a particular speed. Okay, uh, and then, well, there was this, uh, there was another physicist called G.P. Thomson at the University of Cambridge, which I'm sure you know is a, is a, a rather new university to the east of London, uh, who devised an experiment to, 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 to measure this. So he thought, okay, well, if electrons and, and particles are, are waves, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna have an electron beam gun which literally is just a gun which emits one electron at a time. And then I'm going to put a double slit in front of it. Literally just, you know, have some sheet of metal and then cut two holes in it and then put a screen at the very end. And the idea is that, you know, if the electron is a particle, then what you should be able to see is, you know, the slits themselves. So you would see, you know, one line for one of the slits and another line for the other slits. So the electrons leave a mark on that screen and you should see the two slits being imaged uh, if the electrons are, are, are particles. But if they aren't particles and they are like waves, then what you would see is a little bit like if you shine a laser on this double slit, lots of, lots of, lots of different patterns. So what he saw was exactly that. Uh, he saw something which looks like an interference pattern. So the screen is here on the right side. This is just a simulation of what, uh, what you could see if you run this experiment. And you see there are certain dots here, small dots. Every single dot is one electron, essentially the place of one electron. But what you do see is there is an overarching pattern emerging. You see that you know, there are much more electrons here on the, in the middle, and there are much less electrons just on the side, and then there are more electrons again, and then less electrons again. Okay, so it does look like that the electrons are waves, and on the left-hand side, you see a simulation of how, how, how you can imagine electron waves interacting with each other. Now, the interesting thing about it is because uh, is that this electron gun doesn't emit many electrons at the time. So there is only ever one electron passing through this double slit. So what really happens is not that there are two electrons interact with, interacting with each other and therefore uh, yielding this pattern, but the electron interacts with itself as if it was a wave and therefore yields such a pattern, which is, which is, which is rather interesting. Uh, the next thing will be uh, uh, quantization. This is really about, well, there was, a, there was a Danish physicist called Neil Bohr, Niels Bohr, who came up with the idea that, uh, that, uh, that the physics is quantized. You cannot have, you cannot travel at an arbitrary speed, you cannot have an arbitrary energy, but you know, any system will have a certain set of energies a quantized steps of energies and speeds and, and, and wavelengths that it can function at. You cannot have something which is continuously changing, but it necessarily needs to change in steps. And this is what we call quantization. So for example, he had a model of the atom, which is called after him, is named after him as the, the Bohr model of the atom, where he thought that, uh, well, we have, uh, we have the electron and that's the wave. Okay, so there is this uh, electron wave on the left-hand side. So what we can do is just, we need to wind up the wave around the nucleus because you need to make sure that the wave sort of like goes into itself and not wraps around itself to be able uh, to, 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 to go around the atom. So if you have one wave, it just goes around as a circle. Now, if you, for example, have two waves next to each other, that would be the next energy level, okay? So you have the electron going around twice as in a wave. And what you see is this kind of pattern that you see that this is a minimum of the wave and then a maximum of the wave and the minimum of the wave and the maximum of the wave again, like you would see on the left hand side with two minima and two maxima. And then you can just keep going. So what you can do is that you can have then three waves, you know, three maxima and three minima. And, this, and you get this sort of clover life, a clover leaf like pattern where you then have, you know, one minima here, the other minima here and the third minima here, and then three maxima here, here and there. Okay. And you know you can just do this arbitrarily uh, at arbitrarily high numbers, and you can you know add uh, even many even more wavelengths as you as you like, and therefore you will you will just see this sort of like nice cleverly like patterns emerging. But what he says is that you cannot have two and a half waves. 
okay, or, 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 or 3.2 waves. You only need, you, you must have an integer number of waves around the atoms so that it doesn't sort of like wrap around itself and then it just preserves the symmetry. Now, it turns out that there are other more to the story and uh, there was an Austrian physicist, Erwin Schrödinger, who actually came up with the, uh, with the theory and the equations, which is called the Schrödinger equation in that himself, of how wave mechanics really works and you know, how, 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 how does it actually work? Uh, and this is just a rather simplistic view. Now, Erwin Schrödinger was actually a fellow uh, here in Oxford. He was a member of, uh, of Pembroke College. He was a, sorry, a, a Maudlin College. He was a fellow of Maudlin College. And uh, in his biography, you could say that uh, he was a fellow at Maudlin College, but his position at Oxford didn't really work out well because his unconventional living arrangements, i.e. sharing living quarters with two women, wasn't uh, met with acceptance, so uh, that was a, a short-lived fellowship, nevertheless. The third thing is, uh, is, about, is about the uncertainty. Uh, how do you measure, how do you, how do you measure uh, different quantities in, in quantum physics? And it's called the uncertainty principle. Now, this is actually something which is quite crucial. And the idea being, just referring back to the, uh, the, the, the wave idea, is that, well, if particles are waves, for example, we can construct a particle of multiple waves that you see here in this rather scrambled figure. The important part is this uh, overarching uh, sort of uh, purple wave that just is, is the sum of all the other waves that you see in here. And what you can see is that, okay, well, the particle, you know, there is like a certain wavelength to it. Okay, so I can measure the wavelength of this wave, uh, which is just the difference between the, the distance between the two maxima. And, you know, that is, seems to be fairly well defined, which is nice because if I, if I can tell the wavelength, I can, I can tell the momentum with the Broglie's relationship. However, you can also see that this wave is quite spread out. So what you cannot do then is that you cannot really tell where the particle is because the particle seems to be going all around the place and you know it's momentum fairly well and fairly precisely, but you don't really know where it is. And what you can do is that you can add more components to this traveling wave and try to localize your particle more and more. So you see that you just add more components and then you see that the sum is getting a little bit more squished into the middle but the problem is that, you know, you can see that, well, the wavelength in the middle, the, the distance between the two maxima in the middle is getting, starting to be uh, different than, for example, the maxima here and there, sort of towards the end. And then as you add more and more waves, and then you, as you try to uh, localize your particle more and more, the problem will be that the wavelength will get less and less defined because there will be, you know, the, you, you don't, you, you can't really tell what the difference is anymore between the between the, uh, the the different components of the waves. And so, well, what is good for is that you can tell where your particle is better, but what you lose on the other side, on the other hand, is that you lose the information. On, uh, on, on, on how quickly your particle is going really. And that's, uh, and that's, your, and that's your problem. So there was a German physicist called Werner Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg who realized this and it's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which says that the uncertainty in, uh, in X, which is about, which is where your particle is. So in the position of your particle times the uncertainty in how quickly your particle goes delta P is larger than, again, Planck's constant divided by four pi, which is a very small number, but it's not zero. And, the, and, and, and that is something very crucial because what it means is that you, you cannot know how quickly your particle goes and where your particle is at the same time at an arbitrary precision. The, 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 the uncertainty in those will always be larger than this very, very, very small number. And that is not because you don't have a good enough equipment that could measure all this, is because fundamentally how, how physics works, you just cannot know this information at the same time infinitely precisely. All right, so these are some of the basic uh, and, and some of the most interesting phenomena in quantum physics, in my opinion, but what is it good for? Uh, it's very nice that uh, this is an interesting theory and uh, certainly there was a lot of money spent on it to, to be able to research it, but what is it good for? And, uh, and, and really quantum technology is the answer. There are lots of technologies that are based on quantum physics, which had a tremendous impact on people's lives. And that's really the answer. Uh, quantum technology, quantum physics powers the laser, for example, which is used for, for, for cutting and machining things. It powers solar cells. You know, if you didn't know how the atomic structure uh, and the energy levels of the atom would work, we'd be, we just wouldn't be able to, to capture the energy of the sun and, uh, and, 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 and sort of this green transition would certainly be uh, more difficult. And another example is the GPS. 
GPSs, not many people know, but GPSs are based on, on, on atomic clocks, being able to measure time very precisely. If you cannot measure time precisely enough, you won't be able to say, you won't be able to tell where you are with, you know, uh, a good enough precision. So if you just use, you know, a conventional clock, a fairly good one, but still, you know, something mechanical, the GPS would only be uh, good to up to say 10 to 50, 10, 10, 20 kilometers. It would be able to say, it would be able to tell, you know, roughly where you are, but it wouldn't be able, able to put you on a road, for example. Another example is the MRI machine, which was actually developed here in Oxford. Uh, and, uh, and it is obviously used in, 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 in medical imaging or anything which uses a processor, whether it's a computer or a telephone, it all really, really yeah, does use quantum physics all the time to be able to manufacture all these transistors that go into these devices. So quantum physics, even though it seems really uh, detached and really, really fundamental in many ways, it does power, I think, probably the majority of modern technology around us. Okay, uh, now trying, I'm trying to slowly turn towards uh, what do we do that, uh, what do we do about it here in Oxford, and how do we achieve uh, the, uh, how can we actually study quantum physics? And uh, what we do here in what we do here in Oxford is uh, is we study something called the Bose-Einstein condensation, which I'm just going to explain in a minute. What we take, what we do is that we have uh, a gas, uh, and we put a gas, a classical gas, in a container. Uh, you could imagine air for the purpose, but uh, we actually use something called erbium, which is just a rare, uh, a rare earth element like oxygen and, and, and nitrogen. It's just a rare earth element. And we have, that, uh, we have that erbium gas, and then we cool it down. Okay, and if you make the atoms colder, you start to, uh, you start to emphasize their wave-like properties. The colder they are, the more wave-like they are. Because if you, if you remember the Broglie's relationship, it was lambda equals h over p, and therefore if p, the momentum of the particles is smaller, that means that the lambda, the wavelength will be larger. So as you cool down your particles, they will behave more like waves and therefore you arrive into this quantum physical regime. So what we do here in Oxford is that we cool them down almost to absolute zero. Uh, and we really, really make them very, very, very wave-like and that those waves really overlap each other and then interact with each other as waves and not like particles, you know. And this, this effect is called Bose-Einstein condensation. And this is why uh, I say that we do physics with the coolest stuff in the universe, because it really is the coldest thing that exists in the universe. Uh, it is much, much colder than outer space by seven, eight orders of magnitude. And it is certainly the coldest thing uh, that, uh, that, we, that we know of. Uh, the world record is actually held by MIT, as far as I can remember. They managed to uh, uh, to achieve the uh, the coldest temperature there, but there is really no fundamental limit in how cold we can we can go with this technique, how well we can approach uh, absolute zero. And this is how science, uh, the magazine, imagined uh, what a Bose-Einstein condensate looks like. You can imagine that uh, your particles are all bound up in one large uh, packet, and they are all working and you know sort of going around in a nice synchronized way. Whereas you know these other particles around it, they are just like thermal particles which are not part of this Bose-Einstein condensate, and they are just going around and doing their stuff. But you do see lots of particles which are. Uh, uh, which are condensing into this, uh, into this condensate. And this is something that you can do uh, interesting experiments on. The good thing about the Bose-Einstein condensate uh, compared to lots of other systems that you can use to, to study quantum physics is that it is fairly big. Uh, our our Bose-Einstein condensates have say 10,000 or, or so particles and maybe 100,000 particles in there, which is not you know, millions and billions, but it is still something that is, that is visible by eye even, and we can study them fairly easily. It's just that they need to be very, very, very cold and therefore they are in a vacuum chamber. So the question is then, okay, that's very interesting, but then how do I, how do I cool these, these erbium particles, these erbium atoms that we have in our system? And the answer for that is something called laser cooling. And you know, lots of people associate lasers with heating things up. Certainly in, in machining and welding, this is something that you use that it heats up the metal and therefore you can cut very precisely. You can also actually use a laser to cool atoms down to very, very low temperatures. And the way it works is that, you know, we have, your, we have our vacuum chamber and then we have our atoms in there flying around as a gas. And then we shine lasers on the atoms, uh, uh, basically. 
And you can imagine the, uh, the, the laser and the light as being made up of photons, which are, little, which are a little bit like light particles. And this technique was devised by uh, a guy called Bill Phillips and, and Stephen Chu uh, in America. So what we really do is that we essentially have the atoms travel one way and then make the, make the laser travel the other way. And as the laser particles, as the photons are bumping off the atom, they are slowing down the atoms as they are counter propagating the laser, okay? So atom goes one way, laser goes right opposite the atoms. And as the laser sort of bumps off the particle, the particles slow down and therefore we can capture them and, 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 and cool them. But the question is of course, how effective is that? How is it that I not you know, shine a laser pointer or someone and then immediately freezes? And the idea is that you need to shine lots of, lots of laser particles, lots of photons on your, on your atom. And the comparison is a little bit like, you can, the, your, your atom is basically a tank and then you would try to stop a tank with tennis balls. And you just like keep you know, shooting these tennis balls in a tank and then hope that it will stop eventually. Uh, well, you can do that, but certainly, but what you, the kind of number of tennis balls is that we need to shoot 10 million tennis balls per second. And with that technique, we can go down to uh, 0.00001 degrees above absolute uh, zero. And the reason uh, we use that, and the reason we study Bose-Einstein condensation is that because we want to study many body quantum physics. Uh, so it is quantum physics, but not just, you know, having a particle or a hydrogen atom, for example, that, in, that, that Niels Bohr was thinking about, but having lots of atoms and trying to study their interaction. And the reason for doing that is because if you think about geese flying, one geese or 15 geese flying is not the same thing as, you know, 15 individual geese flying around. They travel in this sort of nice V shape. And the reason for them doing that is because this is actually the way they can minimize air drag. So therefore, this is the easiest way for them to fly, the most energetically favorable way for them to fly. So, you know, if you put many geeses together, you see something happening. You see an emergent phenomena that you wouldn't be able to see if you were only looking at one goose. Okay. So we do something similar with the atoms here. And then, uh, and, and this, this has lots of applications, actually. One of it is superconductivity, which is based on how the electrons synchronize their motion, really and how they can, they can go on uh, without uh, any friction and resistivity. It's also something that, uh, it's, uh, it's also present in turbulence. We also want to understand how turbulence works, for example, if you, if you stir water, but of course, in this case, stir atoms and how, how, how turbulence and turbulent phenomena works. It's also uh, present in quantum computing, uh, how the different atoms interact with each other. You know, you need to have lots of uh, quantum bits. You need to have lots of atoms to be able to make up a quantum computer. So therefore you need to understand how uh, to engineer interactions between your uh, quantum bits. But this is also actually present in, in, in the financial world. It can be very well used to model how uh, stocks and shares rise with each other. For example, a good, uh, uh, a good example is uh, the oil prices and, 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 and air industry. You know, if the oil price goes up, that means that the, the uh, airplane prices and, uh, and, and, and air transport companies' prices go down because you know, they need oil to operate and therefore their costs increase. So this is something that, we can, uh, that, that, that this can be applied to. Okay, uh, how does it look like in practice? Uh, and that's the final bit about, uh, uh, about the, the Oxford Erbium experiment. Well, this is how our lab looks like. Uh, we have two tables. On the left, you can see the actual machine, you, all the vacuum components and the tubing and some of the optics, which this is where we have all the atoms. And then on the other table, we have all the lasers and the optics, which just forms the beam shape and the, and the frequency of the different kind of lasers that we are using. And in the middle, these are the atoms that we, uh, that we capture. So if I just go in a little bit more detail, this is, uh, this is the experiment table. Uh, and what you see here is that there is a large uh, vacuum chamber in the middle mounted on this large steel box. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this experiment is actually very sensitive uh, to vibrations. So we are in this new building uh, that the department built uh, a couple of years ago now, actually, and we are at the very bottom. We don't really get to see the daylight, but it is good for, is that we do get uh, a very good isolation from the surroundings. So our experiment is actually sitting on a 60 ton concrete slab, which is completely separate from the foundations of the department even. And therefore we are just very, very well isolated from anything external. And this is something that you definitely need if you try to you know, capture atoms really. Um, 
this is how the uh, the vacuum chamber looks like in a little bit more close up. We, you see that there are some windows on the side and these windows are used to, uh, to be able to shine the laser on the atoms, which is used, as I said, for cooling them, but also for trapping them, imaging them, and just to be able to do all the experiments that you want to have. And the reason this is all in a vacuum chamber is that because they are cold and therefore you don't want them to touch air and the outside surface, because otherwise they would heat it, because in that case they would heat up and therefore you wouldn't be able to do all your experiments. Uh, this is how uh, our uh, science cell looks like. We call it the science cell because this is actually a glass cell and if you look straight into it, uh, it's basically just a, 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 a nice sort of like cubical glass cell, but if you look into it, you see all these reflections on the side, it makes it into a very nice photo. Um, but this is just an all glass uh, cube essentially, which is connected to our vacuum parts. And we plan to transport the atoms there to be able to you know, have very good optical access, which is not blocked by the metal. We can look at the atoms in every angle, literally every angle as, 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 as possible. And this is how our atoms look like actually. So what you see here, and this is this sort of metallic circle around the side, this is just the window into a vacuum cell. And the atoms, if you can see them, is this blob in the center on the, on the left. So the rim is just metal, but this blob are the, are the ultra cold atoms trapped at that 0 0.00001 degrees uh, temperature. And this is something that you can see by eye really, because if you shine laser on the atoms, the atoms start to fluoresce in the, in, the, uh, in the laser and they are just, you know, it's just any other fluorescence, you see them, you see them shining. And that's, uh, that's something which is definitely very uh, interesting to see and very satisfying to see. Uh, to, to, to be able to see, you know, quantum physics sort of right in front of your eyes uh, uh, without any microscope or anything. This is just something that we took with a, with a mobile phone, really. Um, and then now going on the other table, this is how our, uh, our, our laser table looks like. What you see here is that, you see that we have one laser here and then another laser there and then a third laser there. And there are lots of different colors. You see that there is some yellow light here and then some blue light here. And, uh, and, and this is what we use to, to, to manipulate the atoms. So one of, one of our lasers uh, actually creates blue light. And this is the blue light is what we are using to be able to uh, slow down the atoms. Uh, we also have another laser which creates yellow light. And this is something that we use to trap the atoms. The atoms are sensitive to different wavelengths and different wavelengths have different effect on the atoms. One slows them, another one traps them. Uh, yet another one repels them, uh, so that's why we need lots of different lasers to manipulate them. So this is one of the one of the lasers that we are uh, using to to do that. So finally, in summary, uh, to sum up my talk, uh, you know, quantum physics is the physics of the small. Uh, it is uh, nevertheless very important and is a large part of a modern technology. is uh, is based on it. Uh, in Oxford, we are cooling atoms to almost absolute zero. We are cooling erbium atoms to almost absolute zero. And this is something that we, uh, with which we can study various quantum physical phenomena. And it's something that is a highly controllable and tunable system to study many body uh, quantum physics. Uh, I finally need to thank all my uh, colleagues and funders uh, who, 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 who helped me with this. We are a, we are a research group of, uh, of six people uh, and we are funded by the Royal Society and the and EPSRC, which is a British government organization. Uh, and without further ado, I uh, look forward to receiving any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much for a fantastic talk. Can I just check, sorry, a, a little bit of housekeeping between us. If I can reclaim being the host of this talk, um, yes. just in case there's somebody on the on the waiting room to let them come in, right? I think we'll find out. So um, there we go. Um, so thank you again for that. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of links on the chat box for those who have to go. But otherwise, please feel free uh, just to ask Peter any questions that you might have. Don't be shy and remember to unmute your microphone so we can hear you. Can I ask a question? You... Oh, please go ahead, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay. Hi there. Um, so one of the things 
I've never understood that you might be able to explain is military people say that through quantum physics, you can see or sense submarines under the water somehow. Yeah. And can you explain how that works yes. and what that's yes. all about? Yes, 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 certainly, certainly. Um, at the, at, that's actually a very interesting application, of course. Um, I don't know about submarines, but I assume it's very similar to how you can sense, for example, uh, subterranean bases, like there, there is an atomic bunker, for example, underneath. And I'm pretty sure that's how you could like find submarines as well. It's, I, I think it's pretty similar. And what you actually do is that I said that, uh, for example, the GPS is based on atomic clocks. And the atomic clocks, clocks are just very precise clocks that you, know, you can measure the time very precisely. And how does that link to actually finding submarines? The answer is, uh, because of general relativity, the, how quickly time goes depends on gravity. So for example, if you are sitting on top of an atomic bunker, which is obviously made of a lot of concrete, there, obviously, uh, gravity will be slightly, ever so slightly, but slightly uh, stronger than anywhere else if you were just, you know, in the middle of a field, because obviously it's made of lots of steel and lots of, lots of, uh, 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 lots of concrete. And therefore, if you are sitting on top of, a, on top of a, 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 an atomic bunker, time just passes differently compared to everyone everywhere else. So if you measure time and you see that time passes differently and you can measure that it does, you know, do it a little bit differently than everywhere else, you can say that, well, then there is something in gravity. And there is something beneath you. And it is actually something that we can already do. Uh, uh, our current experiment, uh, well, not ours, but you know, in generally, physics can yeah, we, we can already find physics can already find sort of like atomic bunkers if they were given say half an hour on top of an atomic bunker. But the problem is, of course, is that the equipment is sort of like the size of a room, and you are not normally you know let to wander around an atomic bunker and you know sit down on a bench for half an hour. Uh, so the challenge then is that, you know, can you make equipment smaller? Can you make it more portable? And also, can you make the, can you uh, speed the measurement up? And actually speeding the measurement up is about how precisely you can measure it. Because if you can measure something more precisely, that means that you can measure a difference quicker than, you know, if you couldn't measure it as precisely. So I think the answer to your question is, you know, if you, if you would be able to put an atomic clock on a ship, which would just sail around the submarine, we would be able to say that, okay, there is a submarine beneath that ship because the submarine is made out of that uh, large part of, of iron and, and steel and whatever. And therefore the gravity should be different on the surface a little bit compared to you know, if there was just you know, fish uh, in the sea and just, uh, and just them swimming around. So I think that would be the, the way to, to do that. I have a couple of questions here, Peter. Uh, yes. So one from Keith is, why do you choose erbium? Yes, that's a very good question. And the answer is because erbium is a magnetic element. It is rather, uh, rather exotic. And there, I don't know if many uses in erbium as in like in, 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 in everyday life. But what erbium is good for is that it's a very, very magnetic species. And, uh, and, um, and our research actually focuses on trying to understand the magnetic interaction between atoms. Because we already know how bar magnets work. You know, you put two bar magnets next to each other. They repel each other. You put two bar magnets behind below each other they will stick to each other the question is you know what happens if you have not two bar magnets but two atoms which are themselves magnetic would they work the same way or what what effect that magnetic interaction between those atoms have on your quantum system and erbium is very magnetic another element which is very magnetic is is, is called dysprosium uh, so that's also something that many people use not not here in oxford but it's something which uh, people use for example in uh, stuttgart and innsbruck and um Cambridge, US, so Harvard University, I think they use uh, dysprosium. There used to be experiments conducted with chromium, which is also fairly magnetic. Uh, so that's the reason why we use uh, erbium. Thank you. And I have another one here from Rebecca, which is what applications can you envisage? Uh, of our experiment, yes. Uh, this experiment is, is actually very important for quantum, uh, sorry, quantum computing. And the idea with that is that uh, Quantum computers are made up of uh, quantum bits, which is the same like classical bits in a classical computer. You know, one bit is a bit of information. And quantum computers need quantum bits, which will hold also information. And then you need to need these quantum bits to be able to talk to each other, because otherwise you just have you know, lots of bits which are not talking to each other. But the problem with, with, with having lots of quantum bits talking to each other, and this is something which is actually limiting uh, uh, quantum computing uh, these days, is something called decoherence. 
Uh, so if you have the atoms talk to each other, if you have your uh, quantum bits talk to each other, what you say is that these atoms are, you say that these atoms are coherent. So decoherence means that the atoms stop talking to each other and therefore your, your, your quantum computer breaks down. And the reason for that is because the atoms also interact, well, not just with each other, but with all the surfaces and all the environment that is around them. And the information just sort of like dissipates from the quantum bits into the environment that, and they just cannot regain it. So what, it, what we can do, what we would be able to do, uh, hopefully in a couple of years time, is to engineer an environment, which is not just you know, uh, 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 any, any environment you know, with any sort of atoms, but with magnetic atoms in, the, in behind. So even though the information goes into the environment from your quantum bits, we can actually engineer that environment so that the environment pushes back that information into the quantum bits. This is not something that happens naturally. This is something that happens artificially. But what it is very good for is that you could then keep your quantum bits coherent for a longer time, and therefore you would be able to do more complex computations. Thank you very much. I have a follow-up question on erbium, and it's from Keith, and he says, "So your conden condensate is like a super cool plasma." A little bit, yes. Except the uh, there is this, there is a big difference. It's a big difference that super super so, so plasma is is obviously very very hot, and then uh, particles in a plasma are not in the same quantum state. So what you have in a plasma is that you heat up your atoms very 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 high temperatures, uh, more than sort of like the center of the sun sort of temperatures, and then at that at that temperature all the electrons just split off your your nucleus nuclei. And then the electrons just fly away, and then you have something uh, uh, very hot, and therefore you can you can make your uh, atoms stick to each other, and something called fusion. Therefore, you could make a fusion reactor. We do the exact opposite. We instead of hot, if the, instead of making something very warm or very hot, we actually make something very cold. And the good thing about that is what you can then have is that the all these atoms are synchronized with each other. And, the, and therefore you can see quantum physics at a larger scale. You don't necessarily need to find you know, a single atom and then try to figure out what that single atom does. You have thousands of atoms and you can do experiments with the thousands of atoms and they, they, they look like as if it was just one massive atom, essentially. Thanks, Peter. We have Kenneth uh, raising his hand. So Kenneth, feel free to, there you go. You're unmuted now, go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, in the uh, general news uh, lately, there's been some comments about the uh, the standard model and the uh, some properties of muons that uh, yes. of maybe tilting that standard model a bit. Would you just comment on that, uh, Sam? Yes, that's fair enough. Uh, I have to say that I, I, I did see that there are news. I'm not actually 100% sure what the news are about, to be honest. I'm, I just have to confess that I haven't read them in much detail. What I can comment on though is how uh, Bose Einstein condensates can uh, be used to, uh, to look for beyond standard model physics. And this is actually something which is, uh, which is very uh, relevant and recent. It only happened, I think, a couple of months ago that that's one of these Bose Einstein condensate machines were uh, put in a, in a rocket and shoot, it was shot up to the International Space Station. And the idea behind that is, uh, well, as I said, these, these Bose-Einstein condensates are, are, are a large set of atoms which are very, very sensitive to lots of different interactions. But if you have them on Earth, then what limits you is, is gravity, because you know, gravity is something which you know, is just necessarily you know, here, and this is something that we cannot really cancel. But if you shoot uh, things up, you shoot this uh, experiment up to space, you obviously go away from gravity, and then you're in a gravity-free environment. And what you can then do is that you can try to, to, to see atom-atom uh, atom interactions in their, in their most pure form, you know, without any skew or any noise caused by gravity. And this is something which could be hopeful to, to, to be able to understand interactions even better. And it's something that, we can, that can be used to look for physics behind the standard model, really. I would like to intercede here and invite everyone attending here. Uh, a talk we are going to host uh, on Friday at noon uh, is called Hints of Something New. You can just uh, join us the same way you joined us today. And we will have two colleagues from the particle physics sub department, specifically talking about all the latest findings and uh, sharing it, especially with the people who are not physicists and might be wondering what it's all about. So. Just a little thing there. Anybody else has any questions? 
Artemis, hello. Sorry, I can't pronounce it. Artemis, uh, welcome. You, you need to please uh, unmute. There you go. Hello, um, it's hello. Artemis. Thank you. Um, um, great talk, thanks. Um, I just have this idea, and please correct me if I've misunderstood it, that um, certain subatomic particles are sort of twinned or entangled. So, and if you change the properties of one particle, this will be reflected in changes in the properties of its twin, even if they're light years away. So, this has led to a lot of excitement among the likes of, you know, astrologists who say, well, you know, this is proof that, you know, we've got um, a planet far away and something changes and lo and behold this affects um, our lives down here on earth so I was just wondering if there's you know on this level this kind of more philosophical or existential level is there, is there any credibility in that idea? No, that's, a, that's a very good question this is certainly one of the key reasons why I for example choose to do this kind of physics because I think it's, it, is, it is tremendously interesting uh, so this is what you describe is something called entanglement, it is. and uh, and 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 what that means is that you uh, it, that you entangle two particles or multiple particles, and exactly what you said happens that you can have them as almost like twins, and then you can put them arbitrarily far away, and if you do something to one, something will happen to the other one instantly, even though it is you know infinitely far away. Yes. And this is something which has been measured and tested. This is, a, this is an idea uh, which, which was developed, I think, in the early 1900s, actually. It took a lot of time to be able to, to, to measure this effect, but it has been measured and it has been tested to death. So you know, this is something which is there for sure. And, and it is something that is something which is certainly very baffling. It was something that Einstein, for example, was put off a lot by, because obviously the problem with this is that if you have two, uh, three particles, for example, a light year away, then in his concept and in the concept of general relativity, if you do something to one, then well, something could happen to the other, but it would take at least one year, you know, because nothing can travel, no information could travel faster than light. So therefore, if something is light year away, it should take at least a year for, 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 for that to reflect, and, and it is actually reflected instantaneously. So what that means is that the general relativity is not entirely correct, uh, which is something that is uh, that is very baffling. Uh, it is uh, it is it is something that we need to need to correct. The problem is that we have quantum quantum physics and quantum mechanics on you know one side of the ring, and then special relativity and general relativity on the other side of the ring, and the two things don't work together at the same time. Quantum physics cannot really describe how planets are moving around. It, it certainly cannot describe gravity, for example. But also, general relativity doesn't work at the quantum level. It's, it's tested and it just doesn't work. This is something that physicists are trying to work towards and try to, to unify these theories and come up with something that you can, you know, describe both uh, regimes at the same time. Now, answering your question on the more philosophical level, this is certainly something which is very interesting and very baffling, because what that means is that you have physics which is inherently non-local. And so you, can, you could have, you know, uh, I think Einstein actually put this as like a spooky effect in the distance almost like a ghost, or you could think of it as, as God almost, if you like, that sort of, that, that, that changes, that changes uh, something. Another quick comment on entanglement. Entanglement is exactly the sort of thing that you need to make a quantum computer work. So when I was talking about how the quantum bits uh, communicate with each other, what I really meant is that you need, the, you need your quantum bits to be entangled with each other. And that entanglement is what breaks down if you have the surroundings and then you have, the, uh, have your quantum bits uh, interacting with the other, surroundings that you may have and that entanglement you know goes from those quantum bits that you have that the entanglement just grows and it entangles all the all the surroundings around us and therefore you can really you know know what what is going on any longer and that is why uh, uh, engineering an artificial environment which sort of you know pushes back that entanglement into the atoms is uh, is, is is interesting and important thank you Peter, for that I have another question here in the chat box from Meller, and that is, uh, how do you set up the lasers? Do you use machine learning to help the setup? It's a very good question. Uh, there are, uh, I think, two schools of thought in this. And, uh, and, and one school of thought is that you just buy them off the shelf. This is certainly what we follow, and this is what uh, groups with money follow, essentially, because then you can spare the time of doing it. And also, you know, there are companies who are experts in, in making lasers, and they will usually make better lasers that you can because they are just more experienced in this. So our lasers are both sort of off the shelf 
Uh, they are very expensive, uh, certainly. A laser costs, say, £100,000 easily. So uh, whenever I see a laser on the, on the optical table, and as I said, we have many, I'm always thinking that, like, oh, well, you know, on the price of that laser, I could have just bought a Ferrari and go around with that in the streets. So I'm, I'm, I'm always dropping a tear. Uh, and, uh, but the other school of thought is that you can make your own equipment, and you can certainly make a laser if you like. But, you know, making a laser takes a year or two, I would say. And it wouldn't be as good as, 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 as other companies' lasers. Now, talking about machine learning, uh, it is a, it's a different topic. You don't really need machine learning to make uh, lasers work, I don't think. But we did actually publish a, a paper on machine learning. It just been published a couple of days ago. So it's sort of like, you know, fresh out of the oven. And it has nothing to do with laser, but it has to do with is, uh, is looking at the images that we take. So you need to take, the way we, we do measurements is that we take an image of these atoms. You see that this image is just taken with a, with, a, with a mobile phone, but obviously you can use a very good camera and then take an image with that. And what we use machine learning for is that uh, you see the atoms in your photo and our machine learning algorithms identifies the, the cloud, like where it is, how big it is, how many clouds are there. Um, you know, if there are multiple photos, then how quickly they are growing and all these kinds of uh, uh, kind of problems. It is really similar to how uh, Facebook identifies uh, people's faces. It's just, uh, it's just this sort of uh, 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 image recognition, uh, machine learning, where you feed lots of images of the same thing and therefore it will be able to learn to, to recognize it. So in, the, in our case, we feed images of, uh, of uh, well, not me, but, uh, but atomic uh, clouds and it will, it will recognize atomic clouds uh, uh, on new images. So that is what we use machine learning for though. Thank you, Peter. We have Martin with a uh, hand raised. Martin, you're Hi, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, Val. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, quick question. Uh, in your opinion, would Star Trek teleportation be achieved in our lifetime? Thank you. That's a very good question, Martin. Uh, I would certainly like to see it happen, though I'm actually not sure it will. And uh, I think there is a little bit of a confusion that some people don't necessarily understand about teleportation is teleportation is not that you know you you go through i don't know i uh you know a gate and then appear out of nowhere in somewhere else it's actually very similar it's like it, what, what, what you what we mean by teleportation what physicists mean by teleportation for the time being at least is entanglement a little bit what artemis was was touching on so what you do is that you entangle two atoms this is what we can do at the moment i'm sorry <laughs> but you entangle two atoms and you you, you make them far apart and you do something to an atom and then the exact same thing will happen to the other atom. So, you know, you can do something on, on one place and then instantly the same thing or, you know, the opposite thing or, you know, something which is related would happen with the other atom in the other place. So it's, you could think more of it as, you know, clone yourself and then move your clone far apart and you turn left and your clone will always also turn left. Okay, so it's not quite the same thing as you would see in Star Trek that you just like go through a gate and then, you know, I'm, I'm infinitely far away uh, immediately. Uh, but nevertheless, this is, this is the kind of teleportation that, that physicists can do. I think the world record in this is, uh, is they managed to entangle a couple atoms and then move them, actually, I think, pretty far away, sort of like thousands of kilometers away almost. And, and, then, and then manipulate one atom and see that the other atom reacts uh, at the same time. So this is the kind of teleportation that, that we can do at the moment. I would be surprised if it happened within our lifetime, but certainly it would be much easier for me to travel back home with them. Thank you, Peter. I have another question here from Melanie. How do you make the environment reflect the information back to the bit? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it does take a little bit of uh, explanation. So let me, let me find another slide. Uh, which I haven't quite showed, uh, but it will aid the explanation. Um, just give me a give me a second. This is here. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, so this is this is actually this actually has a lot to do of how how the how the magnetic interaction works. Uh, I can just sort of go through this very quickly. So the idea here is that, you know, we, we put our atoms in, a, in something called a pancake trap, which literally looks like a pancake. That's why it's called a pancake trap. So all the atoms are, are in, in sort of like a round rim in literally squished as in like a pancake. And you can see that all the atoms are pointing upwards. So this is, this is like sort of the small magnets next to each other. And what we then do is we try to shake this, shake this pancake a little bit. And what you can see is that, well, if you start shaking the pancake and try to measure the energy, 
of that pancake, what you see is that, well, if you, if you shake the pancake a little, then obviously the atoms start moving and therefore the energy goes up but because the atoms are next to each other, that they are repelling to each other. And therefore, you know, they are, they are they're just repelling to each other. They are repelling each other. However, if you start to shake the pancake stronger, what you then start to, start to do is that the atoms will sort of like appear to be uh, almost sort of below each other and therefore start to attract each other. So even though you shake, the you shake your pancake more, actually the interaction energy of your pancake goes down, which is very interesting. And this is something called the roton minimum. So in this figure here on the right, what you see is that sort of like on the x-axis is, you know, how much you shake your pancake, say, and the y-axis is, is what's the interaction energy and what's the energy of these excitations. And initially it goes up because the atoms are next to each other, but after some time, it actually goes down because of the magnetic interaction and because they start to uh, start to attract each other. Obviously, if you then shake them even stronger, the interaction energy will actually go up again. The reason for that is that it's just, you know, the kinetic energy that takes over and they are just moving around fast. Now, answering your question is, is actually, uh, it actually comes from this minimum that you see here. So, you know, if you make the atoms more and more magnetic, this just this minimum can go almost down to the down to zero. So the more magnetic your atoms are, this, this minimum this dip almost just like just goes down and down. And so the idea here is that if you just have an any general environment, this this line would be sort of like a straight line. And you can interact with any momentum, as in like any any mode of your of your background, equally likely essentially. Whereas here, if you have something which, is, which touches the ground, that means that you can, you will, if you start to excite your pancake, which is your, which is your background here, your atoms will actually uh, preferentially interact at this wavelength, at this particular uh, 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 excitation, because that's something which is most easily excited, right? Because it's something which is close to zero. So what that means is that, you know, instead of exciting all, this, all the different ways that you can excite your background, you actually preferentially excite only one particular way your pancake, because that's just how these interactions work. And therefore you actually conserve the information because it's not that, you know, it's just going around like crazy. It goes around in a very, very particular way because it just goes around, it just, it just it's, it's excited in that particular way and that particular mode. And that's where the energy is, uh, that's where the information is conserved in. And that's how you can sort of make the coherence stay longer because then it's not that you are, you are exciting all these, continuous spectrum of your of, of, of your background but you're actually exciting only a tiny bit of that spectrum therefore you can you can you can uh, uh, make energy uh, sorry make information concentrated there almost if that makes sense excellent thank you peter uh melanie is here is saying thank you so i'm guessing she's happy with that reply <laughs> um before we go we're just about uh, right on time. So I just would like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, special thanks for Peter for an amazing talk. I would like to remind you all that we have uh, other talks throughout the week. You can just find them on our virtual booth. We also host a physics cafe every day at four o'clock uh, British Standard Time. Everybody's welcome to join, not just physicists. And the idea is that we're putting all these events uh, at Meeting Minds especially for people who never did physics and so they get a, a hint of the things that we do and uh, remember there's never silly questions and we love to hear from all of you so on that note a virtual applause to Peter <laughs> thank you so much and uh, we look forward to seeing you at another event soon thank you for joining us bye bye Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, final thing I can mention is that I will be available actually answering any more questions that people might have uh, 11 a.m. British time tomorrow. So if people do have questions uh, which they feel passionately about and would like to have an answer to, please do come along tomorrow 11 a.m. UK time. I will be around uh, answering more questions that you might have. And thank you very much for the invitation, Valerie, and I hope that it was... Uh, thank you. Enough. Thank you very much. So anyway, see you hopefully tomorrow morning at the cafe at four o'clock or if not uh, for the talks on Friday. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to the University of Oxford Alumni Meeting Minds. 
uh, from all corners of the globe. Uh, my name is Val Crowder. I am the Alumna Relations Officer for the Department of Physics. And it's a delight that you can join us. And I hope you can make the most of this session by asking any questions that you have. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Peter Yuhash. I'm sorry, I have to admit somebody else there. Yeah. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Peter Yuhas. Uh, he's a DPhil student in the sub-department of atomic and laser physics, and he's doing research on experimental quantum physics on a Royal Society scholarship. He's also the president of the Cambridge Oxford uh, Alumni Club of Hungary, uh, being an alumnus of, of uh, the other place. So Peter, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Raël, uh, for, for, uh, for hosting me today again, and welcome everyone who are joining from around the world. Uh, I'm Peter Juhas, as well mentioned, and I'm a PhD student here. And uh, I'm, uh, I think the session is mostly about taking questions. So if people have any questions on, on quantum physics, quantum mechanics, indeed my talk from yesterday, which uh, has just made uh, the recording uh, online, uh, then, 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 then please feel free to shoot them away. We can start if you want, since there's only a few of us, if you want to say where you're from and what interest you have, if you're a physicist or not, then we can also sense who, who's here and what sort of interest is in the, in the room. So don't be shy. I see the, the China office has joined, so welcome China as well. Uh, I could just introduce myself. I'm, my name is Tony Sardis, and I'm actually a chemistry alumni, but I've recently taken up studying astronomy and planetary science with the Open University, uh, level two. So uh, I've just joined out of general interest, but I'm not. Uh, I'm somewhat of a novice, you know, in physics, although I'm a member of the Institute of Physics now. But um, So I'm just really here out of interest to hear what people had to say, really. But it was interesting to hear about uh, quantum mechanics, because that's obviously featured in our course that I'm doing now. Excellent. Good morning. So, Tony, are you in the UK or whereabouts? Yeah, that's right. I, mean, I live in uh, Northamptonshire, so it's not oh, right. very far from Oxford, about an hour's drive. So uh, I, I noticed that they do uh, evenings Oxford Science. So... I, I've not really managed to get down to those, but I hope to when that things resume in um, hopefully next uh, academic year, hopefully be able to have some of those again. That's wonderful. So welcome, Tony. Yeah. I don't know, Peter, if you have anything to share about quantum mechanics or anything you might find interesting. Well, I mean, um, it's very good of you, Tony, to take up uh, astrophysics. Today, but I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good thing. Uh, it's nice to you know <laughs> be able to convert chemists into, into physicists for sure. Um, I I think maybe an interesting thing to to to, to start the discussion, but it is it is a little bit removed from quantum physics, really. But it is still something very interesting and very relevant. Is that I got a question yesterday that what is this muon thing about? I don't know if you or any else anyone else in this call have uh, have seen. Uh, that there are some news that uh, the researchers done an experiment with, with muons, I think, in the U.S. and uh, and how that might change the uh, what we think about the standard model and the and the world. And so yesterday I got a question about how, if I can comment on it, and, uh, and 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 I couldn't, I'm afraid, because I I I, I didn't really look into it. Uh, it's a little bit into particle physics rather than rather than quantum mechanics, the very high energies rather than the very low. But anyway, I did feel bad about it, so I did look it up uh after after my talk and that's uh, that's another interesting thing actually because what really happened there and this is something which was featured on 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 you know major newspapers around the world is that um the researchers tried to measure the magnetic dipole moment of muon i will let me just explain that say so muons are particles elementary particles like uh, like uh, an electron or the photon or like the quark so it's just an elementary particle as well as as, as any other elementary particle and a magnetic dipole moment is a, is a number which quantifies how magnetic something is. So, uh, you know, if, once, uh, if a particle has a smaller magnetic dipole moment, then it's, it's less magnetic. If it has a higher magnetic dipole moment, it's more magnetic. You can think about them as being a, a, a weaker bar magnet or a stronger bar magnet almost. 
and say with theory you can actually predict what the uh, what this magnetic dipole moment or how magnetic these particles should be and uh, and you can actually predict it pretty precisely as in you know to like lots of decimal places within good confidence and then also then the researchers are actually have they are also they are also actually capable of, of measuring it to that many decimal places so therefore you can check if you know the theory really works because you can the theory can make extremely sensitive predictions and then the and then the experiment is, is is sensitive enough to be able to test all those number of digital places and decimal places and uh, and, and what you can find is that for example the uh, the, uh, the electric uh, dipole moment so the magnetic dipole moment of an electron is for example very close it's it's it, it 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 agrees with the theory to say like 20 decimal places so i've said and therefore that's a good indication that that the that the theory of particle physics works now, researchers did the same with the muon, this other elementary particle, and what they found is that there is a, a slight, but a slight discrepancy, uh, which is there uh, between the theory and what they measure. And so therefore they measured something ever so slightly different to what they expected. And the reason that is very interesting is because that means that the theory, you know, predicts something a little bit wrong. It's sort of like, you know, it's roughly all right, but, but isn't quite all right. And therefore, that's an indication that how, uh, how, how there is more physics or how the theory is not complete, the theory of particle physics isn't complete and there is more to the story. And these are sort of like, you know, jigsaw pieces that you can puzzle together and then sort of like trying to put the picture together that, you know, okay, it works with the electrons, but somehow doesn't work with the muons. Okay, what's the difference between them and what, what, what does that really mean? So how long does it sort of take for some, a couple of, do you think for any, new experiments like that to kind of become uh, part of the general kind of domain of physics teaching and so forth? It's a very, very interesting question. I, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question, to be honest. Uh, I think that I, I have fairly strong views about physics teaching. You know, I think that, you know, physics, physics, can, be physics can be taught in two different ways, I think. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm Hungarian myself and I went to school in Hungary and I only came to the UK when I started uh, my undergrad, which was a good seven years ago now. Um, so I don't really know how physics is taught here, but the way physics is taught in, in Hungary, and I'm sure it is in lots of other countries, maybe the UK as well, it's quite sort of heavily fact-based, as in like, you, know, you learn uh, the very basics of, of classical dynamics and, and electromagnetism and, and these kinds of things, which are you know very equation heavy and uh, and 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 sort of like uh, knowledge heavy in some ways. And that in itself is a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. But what it can yield in, and that is a problem, is that it's not necessarily very interesting. In the sense that you know, but people think about physics. People you know, sometimes say that okay, you know, science is not very interesting. But I think what they really mean is that they, they are not very interested in equations. They are most people are, I think, interested in black holes, the stars, quantum mechanics, and you know, this quantum computing and this sense of fuzz. But you clearly see that these are these are ongoing topics in in newspapers, etc. And so therefore, it's not the physics which is not interesting. You know, actually, these are the kinds of questions which are in the forefront of research. But obviously, to be able to get there, you still need to learn a lots of lots of lots of classical physics and other physics, which is which is not uh, that interesting in some ways. So, answering your question, when it can, when it might work in itself, uh, work its way into the curriculum, it's not up to me to decide, and I, I, I don't really know because obviously, you know, with these kinds of uh, measurements, to be able to actually talk to them in depth of what these really mean, you do need to understand a little bit about, you know, particle physics and to be able to understand particle physics, you do need to understand classical mechanics and all that. So it's, so physics is like a pyramid, you know, you do have to lay the foundations very well to be able to talk about the tip of the iceberg, really. On the other hand, I think these could be emphasized and, and, and I'm sure uh, lots of people could be engaged fairly easily. If uh, if there was a bigger emphasis on, on 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 active research, even in a classroom, just to be able to you know mention it very very basically and uh, and and then just like a sort of easygoing level, so that people have an idea of what the open questions are and 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 why is it interesting and what if they read something in the newspaper, what that means roughly at least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to pick up a couple of points is that I won't take too much of this time up for myself, but. Um, I was sort of when I was a boy of about 10 or 11, it was the fact that uh, in chemistry lessons, things change colours and so forth. Yeah. That drew me along wanting to study chemistry, you know. Uh, so, uh, but um, the other thing is that in the, I'm on, as 
thanks to the internet, you can sort of monitor newspapers without having to buy every single one. But it's interesting that there seems to be far more coverage in tabloids like the Sun and the Daily Mail and the Express about astronomy and the sort of black holes that you were talking about than there is in the, the broadsheets. I mean, the, the latest thing you've just described was covered, but it's quite interesting, isn't it, that the popular imagination does seem to be fired by these um, amazing astronomical studies because it, I mean anybody can go out and look at the night sky can't they unless you unless you've got a lot of light pollution around of course and, exactly um, so it is something that does um, fire people's imagination yes 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 I, I I completely agree with that I think that's 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 entirely true obviously the uh, the danger of you know some reporting on <laughs> on quantum physics versus I don't know the uh, telegraph or the guardian is that it might not be as high. So I'm not even talking about quality. I'm talking about correctness. Whether you know what they say is, is correct or not correct. I think that's the that's that's I think the key. But I completely agree that you know if 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 these popular newspapers do take the trouble to 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 report on these and uh, and 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 they and they do that, then I then I think that is a it's a direct sign that it's something which uh, which people are interested in for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll probably have my share, so... <laughs> Guys, it's fine. May, may I make a comment? I, I, um, Hi, Trevor. I was at Oxford from 1960 to 63. Consequently, quantum mechanics wasn't actually covered in my engineering science degree. I was just wondering, at what age do you think young people today should be in, introduced to these concepts. I, I really don't know. I have no, my, I don't, none of my children studied science. I don't know whether they actually, uh, uh, whether quantum mechanics and so on would have been available to them. But is it something that people first encounter when they go to university? Or has it extended into A-levels or even GCSE? I, I really don't know. And I, I think it would be interesting to see what your view is. And also uh, another point, I think it's sad that there are so few people with a scientific background in parliament today. Um, and I think that a lot of decisions seem to be being taken, um, which are politically based rather than scientifically based. Uh, um, is, the, uh, are, is the university sort of trying to get members of parliament to understand better some of the uh, some of the scientific concepts that there are today particularly with a view to increasing the amount of finance that's available to continue the, the research that's going on I, I i saw a session earlier this week about uh, um, regenerative medicine and it was very very interesting to see how much work was being done but I got the impression that we could have done a lot more if the government had been prepared to put as much money into that area as they were into the sort of billions of pounds that went into what appears to be a fairly ineffective track and trace program. Yes, I can, I can, I can address both points because I think both are very interesting. Um, from my experience, I encountered quantum mechanics in my last year of school, and uh, I don't think it was examinable in the equivalent of uh, my equivalent of A levels. I don't think. Um, what I think about in in this sense, physics education about in, in in this sense is that I think it could be a very two level thing, and it should be maybe a two level thing. But, you know, it, it, the compulsory part of physics, because I think, you know, some of physics should be compulsory. Compulsory part of physics could be, you know, fairly, fairly uh, sort of like fleshy and, and fluffy and just very interesting and very experiment based, you know, and then just and really just it's just very experiment based. And of course, the equations and the numerics are important. It's important that people understand that that's how it really works. But, you know, it could be uh, just referring back to Tony, you know, like. The nice thing about chemistry is that you you know put two things together and they change color, and it is, that is definitely something which I can totally understand draws people to chemistry. I think physics can offer similarly interesting experiments. You know, things can be you know blown up, destroyed, or, or whatever. You know, this can be this can be interesting, uh, and and I think at that level that 
quantum mechanics could be introduced in a very, 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 very basic way, not to make people think that they understand all of it, but to at least make people aware of it. And then on the other level of, of science education, for those who actually want to become physicists, I think that could be the place for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for going more heavily into the, into the mathematical side of things and then obviously the deep, deeper interpretations. So I think, I think, you know, when you introduce quantum mechanics, probably towards the end of school, I would say, but it could be still introduced to people who don't actually want to become scientists and only do physics until the age of, I don't know, 14, 15 or something, so that they have at least an idea of that it exists and you know what it is about, because the basic concepts, frankly, are not that hard to convey, and they are quite interesting and baffling in, in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. Now, addressing the second part of your question about uh, policy engagement, uh, yes, the, the university does do something about it. I think it's a fairly recent thing that they've launched the uh, Oxford Policy Engagement Network which is a group of Oxford researchers uh, who want to engage with, uh, with, with policy. Uh, the reason I know about it is because I'm on that mailing list as well. Um, and in fact, there is a, a parliament inquiry coming up, uh, which I think is called, uh, which is about uh, the relationship in, in tech, sort of emerging technologies and, uh, and UK foreign policy, how you can, how, how, what the UK needs to do to be able to stay ahead of the game. But then answering your question more, you know, yes, it would be great if there were more scientists in politics, but, you know, I think politics is in a large uh, way based on, you know, people's feelings and sociology and be able to convince people. For a science, well, you need to be able to convince people for sure, but it is, it is much more about sort of facts and who is right, who is wrong. In a, in a not very debatable way, you know, in the sense that, you know, if you're, if you need to publish a result and people either agree with it or won't agree with it, but it's not that, you know, there is, it's, it's much less uh, a debate, I would say, and, and much more sort of like a black and white thing, which I think is a, is a, is a good thing. Obviously, it's not universally true in all sciences. I think this is true in mathematics, this is true in, in physics and probably chemistry, but if you go to social sciences, then it's much more, much more of a discussion of what is, what is right, what is wrong. Um, there are some scientific, scientists who are peers and therefore sit in the House of Lords. Obviously, they don't have too much power on, on, on everyday UK politics, but at least they are there. Uh, there, is a, 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 there are two committees uh, on science and technology, one's for the Commons, one, one for the, one for the uh, Lords. So this, is, this, this thing exists. And it's just a matter of, of, uh, of, of interest, really, from the politicians, how much they want to engage. And I think scientists are trying to do their best to offer their advice. This is something which I think many people want to do. But on the other hand, you know, that's another question of, 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 of what politics really want and what the reality is, what is popular. You know, you can, something can be scientifically correct or something can be beneficial in the long term or mid term, but that doesn't necessarily win you an election in five years. And that is a that is a reality of, of politics, unfortunately. Now, another thing I would touch on is the uh, is is the relationship between science and uh, and, uh, and and politics in relation to the COVID pandemic, because obviously you know now it has become very fashionable to say that science says this, science says that the scientists told us to do this, the scientists told us to do that, and you always ever hear that I feel from the from the mouth of politicians and never from scientists. Which I, which I feel is, uh, is, is, is a difficult thing because then I don't really know if they are just saying that, you know, they did X because the scientists told X or, you know, whether that was really the, what the scientists tell and it's not sort of like, you know, watered down uh, uh, thing. Um, yes, so uh, I, I think the COVID pandemic definitely showed that, the, that, for example, in such a situation, but obviously more generally, science can be very uh, valuable uh, and you know, in this case, particular case, necessary to solve the, the, the situation and handle the situation politically. Uh, and, and therefore it would be a good thing if this could go ahead, but, uh, but I think there needs to be an affinity from the politicians to be able to, to do that. And finally, I'm just gonna touch really quickly on, on funding, in, uh, funding of science, because that's also a very interesting thing. Now, obviously what funding is allocated into, uh, I think is driven by how, much it wins you an election. I really do think that it's true to a large extent. And, uh, and, and you know, if people think that, oh, well, it's nice to be able to do science, but it's not very important, then it's just much more important to build roads, which I guess maybe is. 
uh, then 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 you know science will be prone to cut uh, whenever uh, whenever there is a budget cut because of uh, because of uh, pandemic or because of uh, Brexit or because of whatever else. And uh, and and I think that people but people don't necessarily understand, especially it's especially relevant to quantum physics and 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 and, and particle physics and all these kinds of research is that. They think that it's really interesting to, to study black holes for sure, and that's something which many people are interested in. But it, but they think that it's not useful in the sense that it, it, it does not have a direct economic impact. And and that I think is is, is not true. It's just that the impact is quite indirect. And the um, the example that I usually tell to everyone is is CERN. You know, there is this large particle accelerator near Geneva where they discover all these uh, all these elementary particles, and it costs billions and billions of pounds <laughs> to to maintain that. Uh, all different countries pay into that budget, and it's just a very expensive thing to do. And you know, at the end of the world, yes, it's very interesting to learn about how magnetic the muon is, but how much that impacts daily lives. One with us, that maybe not so much. And the and 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 the example I always tell them is that many people don't know that the internet was born at CERN. It was discovered by actually an Oxford physicist, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, and, and this was just a side effect of, uh, of, of, of having to build such an equipment, which was never built before. And therefore you have to work at technology on the side of it, which is you know, motivated by the, by, the, by the research that you want to do. I think another good example is, uh, is there is an Australian team uh, who were looking for uh, intelligent life. Uh, in the in the universe, and they were like sending some signals into into um, into space. But they, what they had to do in the meantime is that they invented Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi is about how do you how do you filter signals very well? How can you know how can you how can you find a very weak signal in a large in just a noisy environment? And they they literally invented Wi-Fi in the meantime because that was about Wi-Fi is about you know how can I get a, a signal across the wall? How can I how can I talk to devices remotely. So there are lots of these sort of like indirect things which are influenced and, and, uh, and, 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 and which, which are affected by academia and, and fundamental research. And I think that would be something which would be key to communicate to people that, you know, science is interesting on its own and that's for sure, but there's actually a tremendous effect that it has, which is, you know, quite usually quite unintentional, but it is necessary if you want to design uh, these new equipments and, and even more challenging scientific games, these aren't just technologies which are needed on the side. And those technologies are the ones which, which do actually have a very direct uh, effect on people's lives in the very short term. Could I uh, make a comment? Could I make a comment? Please do. Of course. Uh, Eric Albone here. Um, to, <coughs> to, um, I'm a near con contemporary, obviously, of Trevor's because I was at Brasenose from 1959 and I um, did a first degree and a doctorate in chemistry and I, um, I hoped I might have seen your, I think you did a previous presentation in this thing, but I haven't managed to find it, so I, I don't know what you said, so I'm at a loss to ask um, specific questions. Um, but um, uh, on the business about Parliament, there is a thing called the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee, which I don't know if you're aware of. This is not the Select Committee, it's a Parliamentary and Scientific Committee, which um, all sorts of organisations are part of. And I run a small charity, which is a member, and the universities, are, a number of universities are part of this, and they have meetings in Parliament uh, several times a year and discuss with parliamentarians and mem other members from other bodies and it's a very good networking organization and they produce a magazine which is very uh, full of information called science in parliament so um, if you're not aware of that it's a it's another way of networking and getting to know parliamentarians how are you aware of that i wasn't thank you very much for mentioning it i literally just googled it in the meantime as you were saying it it does seem like a very worthwhile organization i do recall the logo so i think i have come across it is, is it not the organization which uh organizes stem for britain which is sort of like a it poster does, competition does, does that sort of thing it's an extra parliamentary group a number of those yes so they don't speak for parliament but they're part of parliaments if you will i and, see, um, I see. I do suggest that that's an organization that you or university or physics department or something might like to get involved in. And it's quite right, there aren't many 
um, uh, members of the Commons that are interested, there are quite a number of members of the House of Lords that are interested. And um, uh, they do have a bit of a link with the select committees. So I suggest that might be a, a way of doing things. Um, the, um, as I say, I have a bit of a loss to ask questions because I haven't seen your previous thing. I don't know if it's still up, is it, your previous? It has just been published, uh, I'm afraid. It has just been published just as before the session started. It just, you know, it needed to go through bureaucracy. I do have my slides and I can share them and 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 and, and sort of like go through very quickly uh, yeah. in like three minutes or so what I was yeah. talking about. Can I that's... talk about education a little bit? Yes. Um, I've um, spent half of my life as a research person. I mean, I've got a very broad interest. And of course, uh, as you know, in, in all these disciplines, you get very specialized and um, uh, you get very specialized and uh, people who are expert in one field don't know too much about other fields. So I think um, your, your, I think the whole of the symposium this, this, this meeting minds is extremely good. I'm very impressed. Um, but as far as education is concerned, I spent half my time in research um, in a totally different sort of area from this, and also half my time in education. And I've been a teacher, uh, and um, I now run a chat. I've now sort of retired as that from that but I run a charity called Clifton Scientific Trust which is very small but which is a ways of engaging young people in professional science and the whole business is about giving students not facts but engagement with science where they have to work for, with, with scientists um, we, we run the most exciting thing we do is we've been running since um, 2001 UK Japan Young Scientist Workshops where we bring um, Br British and Japanese stu sixth form students together um, in person with this um, but the COVID of course is inhibiting that to, to live together in the university to work to get to know each other as people and to work in small team international teams with scientists across the university We've done this in Japan and in England. For the most part, we've been doing this in Cambridge. And um, the whole notion is that the gives the students some idea of a particular subject area, which the, uh, they, they're guests of various departments across the university, give them some idea of a particular subject area, and then they are set loose to actually explore it for themselves with guidance from the student, from the from the um, from the academics in that in that group, uh, with quite a lot of guidance, but they are actually working internationally as a team, and actually it transformed it actually transforms people that get involved, because mm. they see the science is not something is not something where you don't necessarily know answers. It's something also which is very surprising to them, because it involves teamwork. And at the end of the week, they give team presentations of what they've achieved in front of a distinguished audience. And um, I totally agree that, science, that teaching can be incredibly dull if it doesn't have that kind of spirit in it. Yes, yes, I, I think that is that is that is well said. Yes, and I think it's a it's a it's a good thing that you that you are trying to change it. So <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> yeah, yeah, have yeah. my full support. <laughs> yeah. uh, as an Oxford person, <laughs> nice at some stage to try and do something of this sort in Oxford. But we've been doing this in Cambridge for since uh, since two thousand and ten. Before that, in other universities, and um, anyway, uh, that's what I do. So these these are your slides. Hi, if these I may, I, I, yeah. I beg your pardon. If I may, before Peter starts. Um, Eric, I have shared a link on the chat box. Just mm. wanted to make sure that that is the charity that you mentioned. Let's have a look at the chat box. Our website is, I mean, I, I let's have a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scientific. That, 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 that's it. Um, um, Excellent. I apologize, it's not a brilliant um, um, uh, website because I do many things apart from uh, uh, running this stuff. We have a great team of people but um, we are very under we are very underfunded, and um, 
but we, we hope we're doing good things. And do get in touch with me to learn more, Val, if you'd like to. I would love to because we have a huge outreach team and this is exactly the sort of thing that we are really interested in developing more and helping each other as much as possible. So yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt Peter, but I just wanted to make sure I was in the right path. So yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank no you. interruption. I literally just wanted to, 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 to switch to this slide actually. Uh, oh, okay. Just the outline of the talk. So uh, the talk was really about, you know, what quantum physics is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and just really just to touch on on the on the different ideas within quantum physics and then what it is good for so what are the sort of what the sort of effects that uh, that people can uh, discover quantum physics in their everyday lives how do we do this some of the technologies and uh, and and ideas that you can um, achieve the quantum physical regime if you're doing an experiment and then finally I focused on the uh, the, the the Oxford uh, quantum physics, one of the Oxford quantum physics experiments, the Oxford RBM experiment. Um, yes, yeah, so the talk is now online. Obviously, not many people have mentioned it, so I can sort of like very quickly go through this. Uh, maybe without much talking, just sort of like sharing slide by slide, so people have an idea of what's uh, going in there. So I'm just going to send spend sort of like five seconds on every single slide, and then people can get the gist of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these sort of things, quantization, uncertainty principle are the sort of like the main, main uh, phenomena in quantum physics in some ways, or some of the most interesting ones and some of the most crucial ones. And then uh, I told you a little bit about quantum technologies. So what do you what do you see around yourself that is based on quantum physics? And that is a, it's something which people don't necessarily realize, but it's actually quite a wide thing, quite a wide range of of What is the brain of, about? Of what the picture of the head for? That's uh, yes. So this is GPS. Should it should be GPS? It should be just a mobile phone, but it could be any computer with the transistor. What's the, brain? What's the point this of the is, brain? Yeah. This is the MRI machine. The MRI machine was uh, was uh, was also based on on, on on obviously quantum physics, and yeah, it was yeah. developed here in Oxford. And the solar cells, solar panels, mm -hmm. definitely uh, are based on quantum physics. And this is this is meant to be a laser. So I guess it's just a machine which is just doing some welding or something. But the laser mm -hmm. is obviously also mm -hmm. based on uh, on quantum physics. Uh, and I guess it's better if I show you this slide sort of this way. Um, so this is about what we do, or how do we do, or what kind of quantum physics we do in my lab at least so oh, we use something which is called the Bose-Einstein condensate and the idea is that you have a gas on here on the left then as you cool the gas down to very very low temperatures you make the particles behave more like waves and overlap each other and therefore you have something called the Bose-Einstein condensate which is just like a large quantum system and this is how science thought of it so say you a have these... bit more say about again. So how does it look when you're actually looking at this stuff? Uh, yes, I can. I can. It will be later in the slides. Uh, so I will. I will. I can show you that it later, uh, and I can. I, I'll, I'll, I'll show it in a minute. Uh, this is about how you achieve it, and there will be pictures in the end. Of how does it look like? One of the interesting techniques that we use that we use lasers for cooling particles, which is something something which is definitely a, a surprising thing. You know, many people think that you know with lasers you heat things mm. up and then cool things down. What that really happens is that you have the particles going one way and you have the laser light going the other way, sort of like opposite the particles. And as the photons, which are sort of like light particles, bump off your atoms and the atoms slow down. And this is the sort of analogy that I use is that you can think of it as the, uh, as the uh, atom being like a tank and then you're trying to stop a tank with tennis balls. But if you shoot sort of 10 million tennis balls per second, then the tank will stop eventually. But presumably uh, atoms are going in all directions. So the atom goes in one. The, the atoms are focused to go in one direction. So they all come out from a from an open which has a hole in it, and therefore all the atoms go in one direction. And then the the laser propagates exactly the opposite way as the atoms, and therefore it always bumps from the front of the atoms, almost if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the that's the kind of idea. Why do we do this? Is to study many body quantum physics. The idea being that uh, a classical example is is geese flying. You see 15 geese flying, for example, in this picture on the left, you see that they take this beautiful V shape. Mm. And it's not because, uh, you know, they just like to 
fly in a v-shape for no reason the reason is because this is the way they can minimize air drag yes therefore yes. this is their most effective way for them to fly and so the idea is that you have more atoms and, and the, you know larger quantum systems so 15 geese flying is not that it's not the same as 15 individual geese flying they do take up a, a, a certain shape and something which in physics many people call emergent phenomena things which which emerge out of you know, the chaos if you think, if you have many, many uh, particles interact. Mm -hmm. And the reason it is important is because this is something that you need to be able to understand superconductivity, turbulence. Uh, it is relevant for quantum computing, but it's also actually relevant for the financial world, how you model shares moving, for example, with each other. So this is something that we are, uh, that we are interested in. And then answering your question, how does it look like? It looks like this. So we have two tables. Uh, on one of the one of the optical tables, this is our experiment. On the left, this is where the atoms are, and on the right we have the the lasers and the optics, which we use for sh uh, for slowing the atoms and cooling the atoms, uh, trapping the atoms, and 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 all that. And there are some more sort of like in depth pictures of how 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 it really looks like. So all the atoms are in this large vacuum chamber, and this is where they fly. And you see that there are some windows on the side. And the windows are there so that the laser can interact with the atoms which are inside the uh, inside the vacuum chamber. Mm. Presumably, um, presume it's a very tiny amount of material you're dealing with. It is a tiny amount of material. So, uh, so this is actually the atoms that you can see. So, what you see here on this picture is that you see that there is this sort of circular rim. That's just one of the one of the uh, uh, the uh, windows of, uh, of of our vacuum chamber. So uh, if I go back to here, so sort of the rim that you see on the previous picture is the like rim here. So if I go back, this is the rim that you see, and then you see that there is a, a certain blob in the middle, in the on the on the bottom left, mm. and these are our atoms actually. So that's a very very valued guess of very 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 cold atoms. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we actually see. And this photo was taken with a mobile phone. So you can actually see it with, you know, with bare eyes. You don't really need anything, uh, need fancy microscopy, for example, to be able to, to see your atoms. And that I think is something which is really beautiful. It is still a small amount of, of materials. We do have, a, say, 100,000 atoms, which, you know, is a, is a large number, but it's not like billions and billions, which you would that, need for like any that, substantial uh, amount. What's the size of that when you're looking at that? I would say it's like about uh, a couple of millimeters. It's, it's still small. It's not that you know <laughs> handheld or anything, but it is something that you can still see. So yeah, but, yeah, this is about maybe a couple of millimeters across. Uh, say I don't know three or four millimeters wide, wide and then maybe one millimeters in height or so. Mm -hmm. And, and this is like a pancake, which is which is uh, which was uh, taken a photo from the side. So it's like a circular pancake that is like levitated in the in the middle of your vacuum chamber. And how does it behave? In what sense do you mean? Well, I mean, you don't, if you had it in a beaker, which you don't, but I mean, how would it behave? Yes. So the idea here is that uh, we actually try to study the uh, the magnetic interactions between our atoms. So lots of people ask, why do we use erbium atoms? And the answer is, uh, touching back on the muons, is because it has a high magnetic dipole moment. As the muon has a certain magnetic dipole moment, the erbium atoms have even higher magnetic dipole moments. And that means that they are really magnetic. So what this really is, or what the, the way it behaves, is that imagine lots of sort of like tiny bar magnets put next to each other and then, and then sort of like squished into, into, a, into a, 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 a pancake shape. And the interesting thing about this is that if you then start to shake this pancake, then, you know, if the, if the magnets are next to each other, then they repel each other. But if you start shaking it, then they sort of like go be below each other, then they start attracting them, mm. uh, each other. And it's something which, is, uh, which gives rise to a wealth of different uh, 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 and, and fairly interesting physical phenomena. So that's like, that's like a, a, a pancake of bar magnets. Yes. Yeah, a bit like a liquid crystal in some ways where you get orientation. It is, it is, yes, it is, it, it, it is, yes. So all the orientations of the of the particles are, of these small magnets are fixed as in like, as in like a switched on liquid crystal display. I don't want to keep right. hogging all this questioning, but the actual gas that you put, that ju produces this, presumably it's not erbium metal, what is the gas you, 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 um, you, you push out? It is erbium metal, and then that's a very interesting question because I think what you mean is why is it not a solid then if it's very cold? No, and the no, answer no. is uh, is is it, it it is erbium. So erbium is a metal, as you said, it's a rare earth element. 
So what we do, what we actually do is we actually need to heat it up first because you know at room temperature it would be you know metallic like iron. So we first actually heat it up to more than a thousand degrees so that it becomes a gas, an erbium gas, and then this this gas shoots out of the oven. There's there is really just a small tiny hole on an on an oven which is a thousand which is like a thousand degrees hot, and on that small hole the erbium the erbium gas blows out. And then you propagate your laser against your erbium atoms and then they slow down. And the reason they actually don't return to be a metal, and why do we do this, is because they are very dilute. Mm. So as I said, this is, say, like 100,000 atoms here, but it's like a couple of millimeter wide. Mm. Now, if you, uh, I don't know if you studied any chemistry or any science, but you might remember that, uh, that to get sort of like, I think it's uh, uh, 12 grams of, of carbon is, is 10 to the 23 atoms. <laughs> So billions of billions of billions of billions of mm. atoms. And that would, you know, be like a very small amount of carbon. Mm. So with erbium, to have them, to have a thousand, a hundred thousand atoms in such a large space, that means that they are actually very dilute. And you can still see them because the light sort of like fluoresces, uh, they fluoresce in the, in the laser light that we shine on them. But it's actually mm. an extremely dilute gas, an extremely cold one and an extremely dilute one. And the reason it doesn't crystallize back into, into, this, into its metallic, structure is because the atoms don't actually touch each other so there are no bonds chemical bonds mm. uh, between the atoms we, we actually we have to make sure that the, the, the gas is done you enough so that it doesn't become a, a, a small uh, ball of erbium it, because it doesn't, coat, which... it doesn't coat the uh, the um, apparatus it could do and i think it actually does but the apparatus itself is coated so that the erbium doesn't stick to it uh, but we actually, you know, as the, as the erbium comes out of the oven, I think we only capture the, I don't really know this number uh, on the top of my head, but I think it's like we capture maybe 0.001% of the atoms. So lots of the erbium does actually end up being on the, on the, on the tubes, on the inner walls of the tubes. But we are still, you know, it's just, a, it's just still a small amount of erbium, so it doesn't sort of block anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can build up over the years, and this is actually something that we face now, that we'll probably have to open our vacuum chambers to clean the erbium of the, uh, of the, of the hole in the oven, actually, because that's just blocking, uh, blocking the erbium. Mm -hmm. uh, that there is a sort of like a deposition of, of erbium atoms on the outside of the, of the oven that we will physically need to clean. So it does cause a problem a little bit, and we lose lots of erbium atoms, but you know, this is a problem which you face every couple of years, and then you open it and clean it, and then close it, and then start again. So it's not last, something which immediately uh, is a concern. The last question, because I don't want to hog with this, is what, I, what interesting things are you learning about these Bose, Einstein, Pons, um, whatever? Condensates, yes. Uh, I think uh, this is... I think Bose-Einstein condensates are very interesting because uh, these are quantum systems, like a single atom is a quantum system. But what is what is good about them is that there are, you know, in this in our case, there are hundred thousand or ten thousand atoms which make up a single quantum system. So therefore, you can you can study quantum systems in a much larger uh, much larger uh, scale. I can show you a very interesting picture, which I think is is actually quite uh, quite nice and something which is definitely very interesting is this one here. Uh, let me see if we open this slide again. So something that you can do with Bose-Einstein condensate is to is to do interference experiments with them. So what you mm -hmm. see on the left here in, in on, on on figure A is that this is your guess just taken up. Yeah, you know, someone just take took a photo of a, of 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 a, of a, of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And these, uh, and it is, it is chopped up into two parts with lasers. So you see that the laser beams are going sort of like up and below to be able to keep them, a, give them a shape. And there are sort of some like gates almost, which makes for a larger Bose-Einstein condensate on the left and then a smaller one on the right. Okay, but the, it's the same kind of atoms. These atoms would be coming towards you, would they? Uh, these are, these are, these are, these are, no, these are levitated and standing varieties. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine having like two lasers sort of like in front of your screen and below behind your screen as well. So they are they are trapped in a box, essentially, where the laser light is the walls of the box. So it, it is it is it is trapped in a box and levitated as a, as a box. And then what they do is that they switch off all the lasers. And then, you know, what will happen is that the uh, the uh, the the atoms will start flying away because it's a gas. So it will start to expand. And therefore, the gas on the left will interact with the part of the gas on the right. Uh, let me just switch my uh, cursor to this here. So the part of the uh, gas on the left will interact with this here on the right. And what you see is, is, on, is what you see is on figure B. So you see these like beautiful interference fringes, 
you see that you know it is it is it is it is it is it is literally uh, uh, it, it, they interfere with each other like it if it was a wave, and it's very it's very very highly unclassical that you know you, you have two gases two pieces of gas they let the gases expand into each other and what you see is there are sort of like these bright fringes where there are more atoms and then you see these like very clearly separated dark fringes but there are no atoms at all. So that's that being is, held in a box, are they? Yes. So imagine having these two boxes next to each other, and then suddenly you just take off the wall. And what you see is that instead of them mixing and then forming something completely uniform, they force something which is very fringy. Mm. And that's because how they are how the how the uh, atoms behave like waves, and therefore you see literally a wave-like pattern. So uh, on on Figure B, you see the actual image that was taken. So this is the experiment. And figure C is the simulation. So this is what should happen. And this is what actually happens. And you see that it's actually quite similar. So it's quite close. Why is, um, why, why is the first one, the first box, the first yes. A, why is it so unequal? You've got a large bit and a little bit. That's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, this was a Cambridge, uh, this was an experiment conducted in Cambridge. I, uh, I haven't read the details uh, why they are trapping it this way. Uh, maybe if you uh, trapped it equally, maybe the fringes would be less pronounced or it would be more spread out or closely spaced. I think it's, I think, but I don't know, but I think it is because how, uh, what, what makes it easy to, how you can observe it more easily. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, if you have something which is, uh, which is larger and then something which is smaller, then the effect on the, on the combination of the two will be more pronounced than mm -hmm. if you have something which is equal. That's mm -hmm. what I think is happening, uh, but I don't. I don't actually know. Uh, mm -hmm. It might as well be that you know this is this is where they <laughs> positioned their lasers at, and this is how it was just you know this is where they had the space to 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 shave these three laser balls in, and it might as well be just you know something very trivial that this is that this is just how it fitted around the equipment. But I think it is it is it is because how you can most easily observe things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Of course. Thanks, Peter. Just checking, uh, we have a few minutes left. I have shared a few things on the chat box uh, for today's Physics Cafe at four o'clock and tomorrow as well. Uh, but I just wanted to give a chance to the other participants in case they had any questions. Yeah. Very shy. If not, no, I can tell one more yeah. thing about uh, about the BECs, which is uh, which is probably interesting. And this is something which you see on the right here. These are something called quantized vortices. Now, vortices is you know just sort of like you, it's just a turbulence, and then you have a vortex in a in a in a liquid. So what really happens here is that there is you have your Bose-Einstein condensate here on the top left. So it's just you know this pancake as I mentioned, and then you start rotating this pancake actually. And, uh, and, and, if you, and if you think about it, it's just as if you had like a bottle of water and then you started sort of like stirring it with a, with a, with a, I don't know, like a mixer or something. And you would have all these like vortices forming. What is really interesting about the Bose-Einstein condensates because they are a quantum system. These, these vortices are not, you know, going around randomly. But as you, as you rotate it more and more, so the figure goes from like left to right and then, and then um, top to bottom. So if you, if you rotate it more, what you see is that the, the vortices, which are these small dots in the middle, actually are, are arranged in a certain, uh, certain structure. You see that they are almost forming a lattice essentially. And that is because uh, the symmetry of your quantum system. And these, these vortices will be sort of like fixed and pinned in their, in their locations and they will, will, will take up this, 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 this certain shape and these will not sort of like move around randomly. I think this is actually very interesting and very beautiful how you can how you can have vortices which are which are pinned and not not going around even though you have just a, just a, a, a liquid almost that you're just rotating mm -hmm. externally. So this is all something else which you can do with Bose Einstein condensates and 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 study um, study turbulence uh, with that because obviously then this game gives you a very pure system that you can study where you do understand, you know, the, the, the physics and the, and the, and the, and, and the mechanics of things. And it's just very, it's just, a, it's just, a, it's just more straightforward to study. Yeah. Just a final um, question. And that yeah. is, will these slides, are these slides now available on the website? On the Meta Medic, uh, Meta, what I'm talking about, Meeting Minds website? I think the talk is available, but Valeria would be the better person to answer that. So, yes, so um, 
again, I apologize for the uh, video not being uploaded straight away last night. We were completely out of control of that. It is now available on the on-demand tab. So on the Meeting Minds website, mm -hmm. there's an on-demand tab. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can watch the full talk yesterday. I think it might include our questions and answers from last night as well. Uh, we hope that we are going to be able to share this on the Department of Physics YouTube channel in the next week or so. Uh, and also you can watch uh, on the, um, sorry, on the on-demand tab, there is a, a video about the Beecroft building, which is the building, our newest building in the Department of Physics and the one where most of the uh, quantum research takes place these days. Mm. Um, and again, like I also put on the uh, message uh, box, uh, if you have any questions or any follow-ups or anything else that you'd like to share with us, please email me. We'll be delighted to keep in touch and follow up on anything that you... And, that and you a want. further question, will these things be available after the after uh, next week sort of thing? So yes, we hope that we can, I've been told we can, I don't want to promise until we say, but uh, we do have a YouTube channel uh, with lots of videos. Actually, uh, we're about to upload another quantum physics uh, lecture that took place last week uh, for another event. And, and there are lots of videos there. So uh, I recommend you visit that and have a look around. And we hope to put this talk, Peter's talk from yesterday uh, and the Q&A sessions as well on our YouTube next week, as soon as possible. Okay. Any other questions? Well, if, if there are no other questions, I'd like just to thank Peter and all of you for taking part this morning. Uh, again, I invite you to join our Physics Cafe this afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, we'll have um, volunteers around the department. So we have uh, particle physicists, condensed matter physicists, astrophysicists. I think that's about it this afternoon. So it's very informal. You can ask any question you like. Uh, we welcome everyone, physicists and not physicists, so if you have any other questions about physics in general, maybe that's another place for, for you to join us. So, uh, Peter, you have anything else? That's all for me. Thank you very much again, uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so, very much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, Peter. Sorry, thank you, everyone. And on that note, we'll end the call, and we hope to see you at another physics event soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.